Our keynote speaker today will speak to how we build on a better story to reach shared goals. Tim Suttle has been published in the Huffington Post, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, and written several books with the overarching theme of urging people of faith to engage systems and work to achieve justice for fellow community members. His doctoral work was centered on how people make meaning and what makes for meaningfulness in one's life. As a fun aside, post-college, he spent 10 years as lead singer to the band Satellite Soul, check it out on YouTube, which he released seven albums. Today, he lives with his wife and two boys in Olathe, Kansas, and among other endeavors, is the lead pastor at Redemption Church. Please welcome Tim. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you this morning. Okay, so I want to try something as we begin, and this could go very badly, but... But I want us to try this. What I want us to try to do, I'm going to start to sing a song. And if you know it, I want you to sing along. And and seriously, it could go bad if nobody sings. So you have to sing. But um, I also, I just want to see how many people might actually know this. So I'm going to start singing. If you know, jump in. There's 104 days of summer vacation till school comes along just to end it. A few know. So the annual problem of our generation is finding a good way to spend it. They were all parents. Everybody who sang is a parent of some kid. So th that's, the, that's the theme song from um, a cartoon called Phineas and Ferb, which is, in my opinion, one of the greatest television shows of all time. Um, Phineas and Ferb are the, the main characters in this show, but the best part of the show isn't about them. It's about this guy, Dr. Heinz Bufenschmerz, the evil villain scientist who isn't really evil and isn't very much of a villain. He's just this really sensitive guy from a dysfunctional family who is like over dramatic and generally clueless. And, and, and Bufenschmerz is a, a great character. I mean, he's the best. Like he's not trying to take over the whole world like a proper villain. He's just he just wants to take over the tri-state area, you know. It's like because it's good for a villain to have goals, and um, he heads his own corporation. It's called Doof Doofenshmirtz Evil Incorporated. You recognize that? And his lair is this like high-rise corporate office building that he apparently owns. And in every episode of the show, he creates a new innator it's like a big ray gun designed to make people do somewhat innocuous but disruptive things like the slow motion innator or the misbehave innator or the gloom innator that just makes everybody depressed when it hits them and and doofenshmirtz's nemesis is the secret agent named perry the platypus whose cover story is he he's the the boy's pet platypus in fact once a show they will all say hey you may know. Where's Perry? Yeah, where's Perry? And, and every time Doofenshmirtz makes one of his innators, Perry the platypus shows up to thwart his plan, and Doofenshmirtz is waiting for this to happen, and he always catches or traps Perry the platypus, um, not so that he can proceed with his evil plan. He's already built his innator every time. Um, the whole reason he catches his nemesis is so he can tell Perry the platypus his backstory. And he always has some elaborate backstory that explains his motivation for why he's built this innator, the shrink innator or the duplicate innator. And, and these backstories are, are, are seriously the best part of the show. I mean, it's every episode. He makes an innator. He catches Car Perry the platypus so that he can tell him his story, some aspect of his past that explains why he became so evil. And you very quickly catch on to the fact that all evil Dr. Doofenshmirtz really wants is for someone to listen to his story about how messed up his childhood was and, and why he's made this innator to find some sense of, of justice. I'm telling you, you guys, this show is as good as therapy. Like, just watch it. And what makes it so great, I think, is that we all do this. 
all the time, constantly. We all have these stories that we tell about what's happened to us in our lives, these foundational stories that sort of shape the way we see the world. And they serve as explanations for why we are the way we are and, and what we do and how we think. And the reason that we do all this is because at a very basic level, this is how human beings construct meaning. All meaning making is storytelling. That's how we do it. The, the way that we interpret the events of our lives is through the imposition of narrative. We tell stories, full stop. And the stories that we tell are incredibly powerful in our lives. Our stories will determine the meaning of our lives. They will define the limits of what we think is possible and impossible in the world. They'll shape the way that we see each other and how we think about what's happening to us and why. And human beings, nearly universally, are, are meaning-making creatures. And all meaning-making is storytelling. And the stories that we tell will shape the world that we create together and guide our actions. One of my favorite authors is a, a woman named Rebecca Solnit. She says it this way, stories are compasses and architecture. We navigate by them. We build our sanctuaries and our prisons out of them. Stories, she says, are geography. I love this idea. Stories are like architecture. And a bad story can, can be a kind of prison can lock us up and box us in and limit our freedoms and sort of torment, even punish us. And a good story is like a sanctuary. It can make us feel safe, you know? In, in the word sanctuary, it connotes like safe harbor or protection, even a sense of holiness or sacredness to life. And these stories, she says, they're like compasses by which we navigate, their architecture, by which we build our communities into either prisons or sanctuaries. And the stories that we tell ourselves determine in large part what kind of future we create in communities like Johnson County. And we're all just constantly trying to do what Dr. Doofenshmirtz does. We try to just lock each other down for long enough to tell each other our stories. If you think about it, almost every conversation you will ever have involves storytelling. It's how we make meaning of our lives. And a big, a big part of what we're trying to do as we do this is to locate our stories within a larger story about life and the world and what it means to be human. And those stories are like geography. And if we can map our story within a larger story about life, then we can find some kind of meaning to it. That, that narrative will, will serve like a compass. It will guide us, guide our steps. And we navigate the world by, by the stories we tell. It's how we decide when to take chances or play it safe, when to be vulnerable or, or keep our distance, how to decide things like, what's right and wrong or good or evil. Our stories help orient us and, and plot our course in, in the world. And one of the deepest of all human longings is to be part of a shared story. We want our story to be part of a larger story that brings meaning to our lives. It's just one of the the deepest human longings to feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. To see our story as part of a larger story that says our, your life matters, my life matters. And here's the thing. If we cannot do this as humans, we suffer. I mean, we can live without a lot of things. We cannot live without a sense of meaningfulness in life. We're here today to have a conversation about public health. And in any conversation about health and well being and just public policy in general, there are these powerful competing stories that are driving us. And in large part, we're not even 
aware of them. There are a couple of them, a couple of competing narratives. The first competing narrative or story is what we might call a me story. It's about I and me and mine and what's happening to me and those who are close to me, my tribe, my subculture. And that story is always operating in tension with what you could call a we story, which is about us and we and ours. It's about the entire community as a whole and the health and flourishing of everyone. And there's always this tension between the me story and, and the we story. The second kind of competing narrative is, is what we might call a scarcity story, that there's not enough to go around. And so I need to make sure that I, me, and mine um, have what we need first. And that story lives in, in tension with what you could call an abundance story. It says there's actually enough for everyone to flourish, to find health and well-being. And the choices that we make between those competing narratives will in large part determine the kind of conversation we're able to have about public health. Because a conversation um, based in, in a me story, a scarcity story, is very different from a conversation rooted in a we story, in a story of abundance. And so I, what I want us to think about together is, is this idea that a me story, a scarcity story, makes a lousy foundation for public policy because it, it works against human nature. And that a we story, a story of abundance, is actually a really strong foundation for public policy because it works with human nature. So I'm going to try to convince you this is true. How many of you at some point in your education had to read the book, Lord of the Flies? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Still, it's, it's, it's like a rite of passage somewhere around middle school. You have to read this book and watch this movie. And even, even if you haven't, you you probably know the gist of the story. A bunch of pre-adolescent boys are marooned on an island, no grown-ups in sight. And it's kind of boys gone wild, right? Painting faces. Shedding clothes, fighting, bullying, scapegoating. They divide into rival factions and harass and torment each other until the situation turns violent. And by the time they're rescued, the island is a smoldering wasteland and three of the children are dead. That's the story. And then there's this, this famous line at the end of the book. One of the boys who's been rescued, it says, wept for the end of innocence and the darkness of man's heart. And this book, it's kind of come to symbolize the way many people view human nature. That if we're just left to our own devices, we'll descend into tribalism and violence. And you'll often hear the Lord of the Flies reference and cite it as evidence of humanity's sort of dark core. Recently, there's a, a Dutch historian, his name is Rutger Bregman, and he um interrogated kind of the influence that Lord of the Flies has had on the Western imagination. I mean, we we make our kids read this book to this day. But but it is a it's a novel, you know. It's not history. It was actually written by a man named William Golding in 1954 in a world still reeling from World War II and concentration camps and atomic bombs and the ramping up of the Cold War. And Lord of the Flies is a knowledge sort of captured some of the um, pessimism of that time. If you poke around a little bit in Golding's life, though, you find out he was a very troubled man. Like by day, he was this celebrity, this famous author who won a Nobel Prize and was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. But by night, he was a raging alcoholic, so you know, tormented and insecure that he verbally and emotionally abuse his own children who were traumatized and, and would later say that their father had actually um, created a family system that functioned like the Lord of the Flies. Bregman started just questioning, like, how realistic is this narrative? And is this what human beings are, are really like? And, and he actually went and poked around in the historical record to try to find a time when this had actually happened. And I guess apparently children are not 
shipwrecked by themselves on desert islands that often, but he actually did find one and he chased down the survivors. It happened in 1965. Six teenage boys were studying at a Catholic boarding school on the island nation of Tonga. And they had grown tired of the nuns in their itchy uniforms and constant rules and decided they needed a break. So they hatched the plan to run off for a few days and get a little vacation. And so they stole this um, whaling boat from the harbor in their town and headed for Fiji, like one of the neighboring islands. But they were caught in a storm and the boat was disabled and they drifted for eight days with no food or water and eventually um, ran aground on a deserted island called Atta Island. And the story that unfolded there was nothing like Lord of the Flies. That's an island. It's, it's weird. It's beautiful. It's this giant, jagged rock sticking up out of the ocean with these steep cliffs on, on each side. In fact, the boys were trapped on the beach for months, surviving on raw um, fish and bird eggs, which just sounds fantastic for months. It took them three months to find their way up um, the rocky cliffs to the top. And what they found up there was this small jungle and an old settlement that had been abandoned by the native people who, when they were um, kidnapped by slave traders centuries earlier. But they found a machete, some tools, some food. There were coconuts and wild bananas, even wild chickens up there, and, and trees so they could have a fire. And if you remember, if you've read Lord of the Flies, the fire, you know, it's, it, they come, the boys come to blows over the fire. But here, the fire became this source of community and comfort. They took turns tending the fire. In fact, in the whole time that they were there, they lit this fire. Never once did it ever go out. And what they did on the top of this rock called Atta Island was, in essence, to build social systems to help them survive and flourish. Systems for the common good they maintained as neighbors. And they built a system for harvesting water from the trees. There was no well and no natural. There's no streams or anything. It's too small for that. They caught chickens and built this massive pen so they could harvest eggs and, and cook the chickens. They built shelters. They planted a garden. They even rationed their own food. They created a duty roster working in teams of, of two, taking turns working in the garden and cooking meals and keeping watch um, for passing boats. And when they got in fights. They instituted this, this timeout policy so things wouldn't escalate. I mean, these are teenage boys. They just realized, man, we're going to have to have a way to like cool off when we get in fights. So the rule was if you had an argument, you had to walk clear to the other side of the island and then walk directly back and hash things out. That was, that was a rule. One boy made this like makeshift guitar out of driftwood and wire that they salvaged from the wrecked boat. And they would play songs and tell jokes, make up stories. And they gathered every morning and evening for a song and a prayer. And it wasn't easy by any stretch. In the really hot, dry part of the summer, they nearly went crazy with thirst and dehydration. They, they built this raft and just put all their hopes in, in this idea that they could get off the island, but it crashed and they were just devastated. At one point, one of the boys fell and broke his leg, and they all were so afraid. They were scared, and they rallied to, to care for him. But over those 15 months, they built this cohesive community system of mutual concern, trained on the common good and flourishing, of, of shared responsibility, decision-making, and conflict resolution. Eventually, this, this lobster boat was fishing nearby spotted these long-haired boys waving their arms and leaping into the water. And they swam out to the boat, told the captain the whole story. And he, he was like, I remember, I heard about you guys. Every, everything, everybody home thinks you are dead. And they had funerals and everything. And they begged him to come ashore. He went ashore to see the community that they had created there. He wrote later, Captain Peter Warner wrote in his journal, the boys had set up a small commune with a food garden hollowed out tree trunks to store rainwater, a gymnasium with curious weights they built, a badminton court, chicken pens, and a permanent fire, 
all from handiwork, an old knife blade, and much determination. And the survivors that, that Bregman talked to were old men now, but they said that they had this deep connection that was forged on that island it lasted more than 55 years. And I think this story poses an Im important question about human nature. You know, why didn't the boys from Tonga go all Lord of the Flies when they got on the island like they're supposed to do? And the answer is they chose to build their common life on the narratives of we and abundance. The foundation for life in their little community wasn't a me story or an I me mean mine story or a story of scarcity. It was a we story and a story of abundance. And because they made that, that choice, they felt a sense of meaningfulness in their life and in, in their participation in this community. And because of this, they were able to see just a fundamental truth about human communities that we can't see if we're stuck in a, in a me story, in a scarcity story. And, and that fundamental truth is that our well-being as persons is connected to the well-being of others. The story that the boys told themselves was, we're all in this together. And, and there's enough for all of us to flourish here. Because that was their core narrative. They, they built their little society on a very strong foundation that reflected this idea that's, that what's good for the whole will be good for each member personally. Because our well-being as persons is connected to the well-being of others. And, th and this idea is deeply rooted in human nature. Of course... It's much easier to do with a group of six Tongan boys. It's much harder to pull this off in a diverse community like Johnson County. Bigger groups tend to form factions, compete for resources. The competing narratives kick in. When the systems work well for me and for my group, it can be very hard to see how they might not work for other groups. And even if we can see this, we're often tempted to just blame the individuals and miss the systemic drivers of unhealth. And even if we can recognize the systemic drivers, it's very difficult to accept any kind of change that might diminish my advantage or the, the privilege or the benefits of my group in order to create a more equitable system. Plus, in our society, there are just these powerful institutions making tons of money and gaining incredible power from leveraging competing factions. And they want us to stay bitterly divided. And so they just constantly fuel the me narrative, the scarcity narrative, and then use the power and money it generates to buy influence. And so as a result, much of our public policy has been built on the Lord of the Flies narrative. And it's rooted in a me story and a scarcity story. And it's just a lousy foundation for public policy, primarily because it obscures the fundamental truth that our well-being as persons is connected to our well-being as a community, the well-being of others. And, and so this is, this is what I think. Our health as a community here in Johnson County over time, is dependent upon our ability to switch from a me scarcity story to a we story and a story of abundance. To build our public policy, not on the Lord of the Flies narrative, but the same narrative those boys from Tonga embrace, the idea that there's enough, there's enough for everyone to flourish and find health and well-being if we create equitable systems on that strong foundation. And making the switch of narratives, it's actually very simple. It's just incredibly hard to do. Like it's not complicated, but it's challenging. I think our future depends upon our willingness to make this shift. 
that that first shift from me to we. This this is an an uphill climb. I have a pastor friend who's uh, a Native American. He he told me this story. You remember um remember the old black and white Lone Ranger and Tonto um, TV show? I just kind of dates me. I just remember as a little kid watching this Saturday mornings. So Lone Ranger, if you know, he's he's this uh, Texas Ranger who has a sidekick who's a Native American who saved his life, and they've saved each other's lives multiple times, and they travel around, you know, fighting bad guys. And the two are close. Like, they do everything together. They're like brothers. But there's one time they were up in the Dakota territories, and they're riding along, and they look up and realize there are like 10,000 Sioux warriors on, on the ridge above them, just staring down at them. And they stop and look up, and, and the Lone Ranger says, like, we're in a pretty bad fix here. What do you think we ought to do? And uh, Ponto takes one look at his friend and one look at the warriors and says, what do you mean we, white man? Right? And that's, that's the switch we have to, to make. What do we mean when we say we? Who's, who's the group that we're talking about when we use the word we? And is it separated by race, race and ethnicity and income and gender and education? Or are those groups that are super important, or are they rooted in like an essential oneness first? And, and so a lot of our problem is, is, and often our policy struggles are fueled by this problem of our we-ness. Any, um, any Friends fans, by the way, I, can, I, can do, I could do a whole talk just using lines from the TV show Friends. It's a sickness. Do you remember Chandler had the we that he had to do? He's like, my we is out of whack, right? That's our problem. Our we is, sorry, it's like the middle school boy in me just couldn't help making that association. But def- trying to, to, to shift from defining our we primarily through our factions and our subgroups and trying to think of our we as the whole of Johnson County. And the way to do this is actually pretty, pretty simple. Are you familiar with the two wolves parable? It's, you know, there are two wolves living inside each of us, and they're always in, in a struggle. They're fighting one another. There's a me wolf that lives on I, me, mine, and my individual destiny and the destiny of my group. And there's the we wolf fixated on us and ours and our collective destiny. And the parable asks, which wolf wins? Anybody know the answer? If whichever wolf you feed, right? Switching from a me story to a we story, it's actually quite simple. It just requires leadership from ordinary folks, just like those of us here in this room who are willing to feed the right wolf and feed the story of we over me, feed the story of us and our collective destiny over and above I, me, and mine. The second shift um, from scarcity to abundance is an interesting one. Here, it's, I think, really helpful to recognize the hidden drivers of scarcity. And this is part of human nature. It's part of our struggle. It's the way we have this tendency to feel threatened by like, the success and flourishing of those with whom we share some kind of social space. And so it, it is kind of universal. It's a tendency that like when our say our friends are getting good jobs and we're struggling to find work, or when our peers are promoted above us, or a teammate has like a a sudden jump in performance, or a friend gets a bigger house in a nicer neighborhood, or everybody's getting married and having kids except us, or everyone's kids are like excelling and ours are are struggling. When things like that happen, we want to feel, we want to feel happy for them. And, And in in a way, we are, but part of us feels resentful and jealous, depressed, and, and, and worried that maybe we're missing out on the good life, good stuff, like we're going to be left behind. You may recognize that, that feeling. It's just a universal human thing. It's weird because um, the closer they are to our social position, the more intense this is. Like if, if I hear like somebody like, I don't know, Miley Cyrus got a 
got a big book deal and and big advance. I feel nothing. Like I occupy zero social space with Miley Cyrus, right? But if one of my friends gets a book deal with a big advance or or like has success in some area where I feel like I'm really struggling, I tend to feel threatened by this. I don't even really know why. Cuz it has no bearing on, on my life. It's it's this kind of comparison that really drives scarcity and the, and the fear that if, if, they, if they succeed, I might not be able to, even though it's not true. There's no logic to it. And, and scarcity is, is, is driven by this deadly combination of comparison and fear. Fear is the emotional component of scarcity. It's fear that there won't be enough. And so I'll end up lacking something that I need. And these two things, comparison and fear, they drive this sense of scarcity. Unless we've been really trained in a more healthy response, unless we learn how to feed the right wolf, we'll feel threatened by the success and flourishing of others and haunted by the fear that there just might not be enough for everyone. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but... In, in our society, sort of the quickest way to political power is to get people comparing their own lives to others, to stoke comparison. Some other group is rising, you know, you should feel threatened by this. You stoke scarcity, there's not going to be enough for everyone. And you were here first, and now you're going to miss out uh, on the good, good life. Like you, you do that well, you can become president. And many of our, our family and our friends and our neighbors and coworkers, and if we're honest, all of us from time to time get trapped in a story of me, a story of scarcity. And it is, I believe, the task of leadership to feed the right wolf, to help people make meaning of their lives through a story of us and a story of abundance that actually does have the power to give, give people meaning. If we're gonna to work together to create systems and policies in Johnson County that function so that everyone has an equitable shot at flourishing and health and well-being, then the story that we tell about our world as we lead within whatever sector we're a part of, that story will determine the kind of community we build here in Johnson County, the kind of future that we imagine for ourselves and our kids and the kind of systems that we create and policies we pursue. And the me story, the, the story of scarcity, it's just a lousy foundation. And the story of us, the we story of abundance, this is a strong foundation because it really does work with human nature and this desire to be part of something bigger than ourselves that brings meaning. And I honestly believe that our shared health as a community in Johnson County is depending upon our willingness to switch stories, to feed the right wolf, let our imaginations be captivated by the conviction that in a community as prosperous and just kind of deep down good as Johnson County, there's enough for everyone to flourish and find health and well-being. Thank you for your time, everyone, and for letting me share some of my thoughts with you. Thanks.